So are, is a PFAS considered an endocrine disrupting chemical? There's a lot of uh, news on EDCs. Is that like an umbrella term for all these or are there subcategories? Probably yes. I, I, that is not really my area, my field. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, endocrinology, that's super complicated. And there are so many hormones that have that give so many signals to the body. But everywhere where these hormones act, other chemicals can interfere. And and PFAS also do that at some point in some way. But I don't know exactly how and where and why. The, the reason I ask is you and I have a lot of uh, friends in common who are scientists uh, and some of our colleagues... Um, have told me that they can make a plausible case that chemical pollution, endocrine disrupting chemicals um, can be a bigger risk to human and the natural world futures than climate change. What, what do you think of that assessment? And can you speculate on that? <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't compare them in on a scale because there are different dimensions they, they act in parallel we are on under these stressors under these impacts anyway from both sides and from other sides as well we are there are other stresses uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't compare them on on a scale of bigger or, but I, because both of them are happening. We are under toxic impacts and we show, the population, humans show the effects, we see them. There are so many non-communicable diseases that have increased a lot over the last 15, 20 years and that is caused by, to some extent, certainly by chemicals, but for sure. At the same time, we see all the, the climate effects and this year, 2022, is, is a drastic, I think, uh, a turning point probably and we have seen so much about uh, all the, the heat waves and droughts and the impact. So I, just, I think we are under all of this now. No, I agree with that. I, the reason I pose the question is we have tens of millions of people aware and working on climate change issues, rightfully so, uh, both for uh, adaptation and mitigation. But we may have tens of dozens of people working in your sector. It seems to be just widely unrecognized as a kind of a existential risk in coming decades. So I'm just wondering if this goes unchecked and if it's a slow ticking time bomb of the impacts both to humans and to other species, what could happen in the next 50 years yeah. with the accumulation of these uh, PFAS, endocrine disrupting chemicals, other things. What do you think about that? I, I mean, what would be things that would happen? And by the way, you mentioned humans and our livestock. Are we seeing the impacts of PFAS or endocrine disrupting chemicals and sperm count decline on non-human species? Yeah. So first point was the number of people working uh, on these problems. And I totally agree. The chemicals problem, the toxification problem, I think is underrepresented. It's under, it's not really addressed in the way and to the extent it should be. And there is a yeah, whatever. A bias, a certain the picture is is too narrow. But of course, on, on the other hand, if we have many more people working on chemicals, we will come back perhaps to this later. We have an, We also would have to communicate all of this. We have, and then there may be also an information overflow. We have to learn about how to handle all these different messages from the different parts of the problem. But I agree, more people, more resources, more time and money is certainly needed for the chemicals problem. And I can tell you why in, in a couple of minutes. That is, is certainly the case. Now, what is coming out of this? And I think it's probably what we already see. As I said, there are all these diseases that that in, have increased, are increasing, and that's probably just going on like this. So it is all these um, cardiovascular diseases, it's uh, metabolic diseases, obesity, it's reproductive problems like the sperm count, the sperm decline. So that's co continuing. So, so metabolic diseases, cardiovascular obesity could have origins from the chemical pollutions that we're consuming invisibly? Definitely. Definitely. How, how so? I guess even the term... 
uh, there's even the term obesogenes for chemicals that cause obesity. So somehow, again, that's not really my area, but what I have learned, what I can, I can say here is early in development of a, a fetus or even a newborn, or I guess a fetus, whatever exactly it is, uh, there are different types of cells, and for example, there may be bone cells, cells that will form bones. They are reprogrammed into fat cells, and then you get obese animals. It's, this has been done in, t in, in, in animal tests, and there is there were mice, and there was one mice, mouse that was normal, and there was the, the mouse that was treated, and the, that was three times was the size and the weight of the normal mouse. So we can see that how these cells are reprogrammed and you turn into a fat tissue. Shocking. I, I, so this is yeah. happening in utero already before yeah. they start eating McDonald's or whatever. Yeah, but, but then of course, exactly, later on we may add on to this first exposure and do more harm because there are so many hormonal... Uh, there are so many changes that are triggered and controlled by hormones in puberty and later on in life where these chemicals can again interfere. So that, that is an ongoing process. And also testicular cancer in young men is something that happens more and more often and is a signal here. So you see all of these these elements of a bigger picture are already emerging. I think that is something we have to just project into the future as an answer to your question, what's coming out of this chemical pollution problem. So you and I have known each other for a long time and you've followed my work and I talk about the biological, um, the behavioral aspects of why we are in this mess. And one of them is that we're a biological species that cares about the present more than the future. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the risks that we see are, are emotionally invisible to us. There's nuclear risk, there's climate change risk, but climate, we're at least seeing heat waves uh, and, and fires uh, in Australia and, and British Columbia and things like that. So we get this emotional reminder or, or glimpse of what's coming, but not so on these microplastics. Uh, unless there's a news or an interview like this one, they're just totally invisible. So it's just yet another aspect, another cost of our economic system that is fully backloaded that we don't uh, include in our everyday prices and decisions. Right. I totally agree. And there are obvious reasons for that because, as you said, it's invisible. These chemicals are are not visible in, in the water we drink and the food we eat, although packaged or processed and packaged food may contain lots of them. Uh, that's what Jane Munke with the Food Packaging Forum does. And we still don't see them. And then secondly, really, even if we know about or learn about it, what can we actually do? Because these chemicals are not part of our, our lives. They are not a moving part of what we normally do. We have no, no agency here, really. They are in our environment, in our computers, in our food packaging, in our clothes and whatever. But again, we have no agency. We would have to change a lot to create agency for people to be able to decide what kind of chemical do I want to have and why and how and what not.